Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. It makes it a little more heartbreaking when you're watching the Washington Capitals first playoff game. And the first goal they allow is from Matt Rempe. <laughs> Dude, they are so out of place. It is. What are they doing there? He As probably a re- dangled Dylan McElrath. <laughs> As a Red Wings fan, it especially hurts. If the Red Wings were in, people would be having the same conversations about them. But then you see like the pregame statistics of like where Washington ranks among 32 NHL teams. And it's like 27th, 29th, 25th, 30th, and all these different metrics. And you're like, this is a 16-team playoff. Why are you here? Charlie Lindgren's the only answer. What I have taken from watching Washington's first playoff game is that not only do I think Charlie Lindgren should win the Vesna, I think he should get serious heart consideration because my God. I've 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 come around a little bit on the idea of like a play in tournament. I'm still kind of iffy on it. I think when the league expands, we're gonna see it no matter what. But never before have I thought they should shrink the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Very much a shrink the game moment. We'll get into our, our playoff brackets later and This was a very chalky year. Like, it's very hard to kind of pick the upsets because it's almost never the higher seed wins all eight series across the first round. But this year, I was like, it's going to be a little difficult. But the Washington one was an immediate. I think I actually might have picked a sweep there. I might have as well now that I think about it, actually. And if I didn't, after watching that first game, I'm changing it to a sweep. (laughs) (laughs) Folks, this is our... We're not going to just lament about Detroit not making the playoffs this episode, but we are going to be talking about... The Detroit Red Wings season that just happened this episode. This is one of our biggest episodes every year. The Detroit Red Wings season in review for the 2023-2024 season. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey and a little bit about the NHL and the playoffs. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we are going to be covering every part of the Detroit Red Wings season that was notable. The offense, the defense, the goaltending, how coaching and management handled the season, team trends, overall stats, the highs and the lows, how the Red Wings performed relative to our expectations for Hockey Town, any surprises or disappointments, you know, our picks for team MVP, most improved, and other de facto awards. And then we'll get into some notes about the Red Wings. The exit interviews generated some buzz as as Kane and Larkin and Iserman and others uh, conducted their media exit interviews for the season. And then we'll talk about some news across the NHL. We'll give you insights into our picks for the 2024 NHL playoffs. We'll read out our brackets and Utah blanks, which might actually be their name the upcoming season. Some updates there. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Podcast. If you want to help support the show and join the so-called Dub Dub Club, as named by Steve Dangle, keep him in your thoughts right now. He's, he's having a rough time annually this is you know about when that starts if you join the dub dub club some of the benefits you get are access to our patreon exclusive discord which is a phenomenal community you also get access into all of our bonus content we record bonus overtime episodes right after these main ones last episode was 50 minutes approximately five zero of just completely deranged content that people seem to love we have a, a fun time doing it i think there's a lot of it it's, it's loose. We have a lot of fun. It's a much different tone to this show, and, and we really uh, kind of enjoy putting that out. So that's another benefit you get. You're also automatically entered into all of our giveaways. For example, this past season, we gave away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going to our Patreon supporters. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast for all of that and more. The season is over, and for a while, it looked like we wouldn't be running this episode for at least another couple weeks. Nevertheless... Tis the season to review the season, the Detroit Red Wings 2023-2024, even though some of the benchmarks came in at about or right exactly where we predicted, a much, much different year overall than we anticipated in terms of how we got here. Yes. Again, as we talked about down the stretch, if you looked at where the Red Wings were at the end of the season in a snapshot, And all you saw was the standings, the results, everything. Your immediate thought is massive success relative to where this team was. Huge improvements, 
a lot of things must have gone right to get there. And then you find out what the path was to get there, and the opinion changes quite a bit. A little bit, at least. A little more than a little. It, not dramatically, but I'll call it more than a little. The Detroit Red Wings finished with the exact same amount of points. That was the cutoff for the playoffs, 91. It was a 41, 32, and 9 record. 27 of those 41 wins were in regulation. 38 were in regulation or overtime, so only three shootout wins in there. They were 3 and 1 in the shootouts. They lost out on the regulation win tiebreaker to the Washington Capitals. So Washington actually had five more regulation wins, even though Washington had one fewer win. So that's why Detroit didn't make it. But they were the first team outside of that wild card spot. So Pittsburgh finished three points behind them at 88. So Detroit was right there. And preseason, we talked a lot about, you know, Detroit could be in the mix here. This is about there, thereabouts of where we expected they could be on a good season if they got the goaltending, and they did for, for periods of time. The obvious context here is that they were firmly in a playoff spot, you know, eight, nine points safe at the end of February. So that's that's what Brad is referencing. But instead of talking about the whole overall team, let's start with the players Let's go with the offense overall. This was a very high-scoring team for at least a good chunk of the season. And it faded as the depth went away in, in March and April. The depth scoring in Detroit had to rely a lot more on their best players. But overall, the offense did contribute much more than a team that we anticipated them to be, which was a team that would struggle to score at points. Yeah, there were a lot of green and red flags throughout the season. Obviously, those flags were waving at different times, depending on what play you're talking about. The big takeaway I have from the offense, though, was a top line that was absolutely humming from opening day to the final game. I have a lot of complaints with the depth on this team, especially when the games got more important and how they absolutely disappeared offensively. But Lucas Raymond got better as the year went on. Dylan Larkin was great all year, despite playing very obviously hurt towards the end of the year. As he does every year. Was still able to produce. Alex Dabrinkit had a good year. Not the huge year that we were all hoping for, but he was consistent. His playmaking was a surprise. His goal scoring, specifically, was a little inconsistent, but he's always been streaky. So I don't think anybody was surprised by that. A little disappointed, sure. you'd, You'd hope for a little more consistency on that end of his offense, but they have a legit threat in those three every game as the top line, even though they didn't play together all year. So going into next year, that is one huge question mark that you can erase. Offensively speaking, everything below that's now a giant question mark. Is Kane was great. Will he be back? Perron was okay to good for most of the season. Will he be back? Comfer had his moments, maybe a little overpaid, maybe a little too long, but he was overall a positive. Almost every forward below that, though, there's a question mark whether it's followed by several exclamation marks or just the lone question mark. It's going to be a very interesting offseason, but overall, they exceeded expectations this year, even with a disappointing finish from eight or nine of them. I think one thing to add about the offense as well is they saw 13 guys hit double digit in goals this year. So that was a huge jump too, because in previous seasons, we had seen the offense completely vanish when someone like Dylan Larkin or or Lucas Raymond were out of the lineup. And yeah, the offense did disappear in a couple stretches this season, but from a holistic view, I think it was much improved in in terms of overall depth scoring. Brad, you noted that the offense went away at some point and we'll talk about the why behind that in a little bit but in general i do agree there's there's a good depth to the scoring and not even just you know the 10 goal scores you look at 20 goal scores larkin had 33 raymond had 31 debrinkit had a streaky 27 patrick kane had 20 goals in 50 games and then jt confer with 19 fabry with 18 sprung with 18 and then Perron not far behind a 17. Like a lot of guys either at 20 goals or pretty close to 20 goals and that's a really good sign there's the sequencing of the goals. Yeah, that, that's a different story. And especially as the games got big and the team had to battle through injury and this 
devastating flu bug that at some point put Mo Sire in the hospital and he still played that game. Monster. I, I think that was a bigger story than maybe the team was letting on over the course of the season. But for all the things that could have gone wrong this year for the Red Wings and some of them that we predicted Wood did, for example, defense, it was tough out there for Mo Sider. Goaltending, it was either very high or very low and not much in between, which spelled for success in Detroit to have an opportunity to perform in January and February and pull themselves out of the slump. But when they needed them the most in March, they just weren't there. But the scoring wasn't overall over the whole balance of the season. The scoring wasn't the issue. They were a top 10 in league scoring. And yeah, it, it didn't come through from the depth down the stretch. But Detroit was still in the mix. They were there up until the very last minutes of the regular season. And that's about all you can really ask from the offense. Now, a, a little bit of a teaser for next episode is what's Detroit going to do to prepare for next season. A lot of that offense might go away, as Brad referenced. So that that's a conversation to be had. But let's focus in on the players, and let's start with the captain, Dylan Larkin. 33 goals, 36 assists, 69 points nice in 68 games. So again, another season where Detroit is, their captain is at a point per game. Tough season for him. And we saw in his exit interview, a tough year for him personally, as as you think about what him and his his wife had to go through. Really hard to, to see Dylan Larkin you know, have to to go through that and really kind of, it's just Dylan Larkin's in his nature to be such a warrior to kind of play through that and still show up for his team. Those 14 games that he missed were the only thing between him and the MVP, the de facto MVP trophy for the Red Wings again this season in my mind. What more could you have asked of him this year? Yeah, he didn't play 82, but he probably played a lot more games than he should have given the injuries he was dealing with the last stretch of the season, he was still productive. And I think everybody watching would agree. He looked slow. When has Dylan Larkin ever looked slow? He, he was visibly injured for that final stretch and he was still out there getting it done. And yeah, obviously with the huge heartbreak he suffered in the middle of the season, you know, it's devastating. That could throw a whole guy's year off mentally having to have that on you. And he was still out there. The only thing, like, knock against him this year was he only played 68 games. But with the style of hockey Larkin plays, that's going to happen. That's going to be more normal than not because he's fearless out there. He plays fast. He plays hard. He plays aggressive. And injuries come with the territory. And this year it didn't happen at an opportune time. But... Well, when it the Red Wings are a perennial playoff team, it actually will come out the perfect time because he'll be coming off LTIR. He'll be able to use that <laughs> cap right. space. It'll actually be perfect. So he is the perfect player. That's e- Evan, you know what's going to happen. Everybody listening knows oh, what's happened. I know what's coming. We're going to be in our cup window. It's going to be our year. But that summer before is going to be the year they update the CBA, and then Larkin's going to get hurt in February, and then he's going to come back for game one of the playoffs, but they won't get any cap relief because they finally closed the loophole. Just like this year is the year they're going to win the draft lottery and only move up 10 spots because they've closed that loophole as well. <laughs> but yeah, Dylan Larkin continues to be... If, if you look at you know what pulled the cart out of this rebuild, and not that Detroit's fully out of it, I'm not trying to be a Pierre Dorian here, but... What has been the most consistent theme as Detroit's work to get out of this rebuild? It's been Dylan Larkin. And what we saw this year when you surrounded him with Alex DeBrinckit and a more improved Lucas Raymond and Patrick Kane, you saw what we always suspected with Dylan Larkin, which is this guy has so much more to his game. Once you start to surround him with more elite, more high-end NHL offensive talent, which shouldn't come as a surprise for anyone who watches the Red Wings, but you saw a lot of national media or or fans who were kind of tertiary or or just on the periphery of watching Detroit, and they thought, oh, wow, this guy actually can do way more, and he can. He can be, you know, an 80 to 90-point player, and you never know if he has even more to him. He he does everything all across the ice. The only really – the part of Dylan Larkin's game that you would want is you want to shelter him and allow him to be more of an offensive impact player before Lucas Raymond stepped up and started scoring those big goals. And before Patrick Kane came in and started scoring those big goals, Dylan Larkin was pretty much the only guy scoring big goals and big moments or making big plays and big moments consistently. It was a tough season for Dylan and he still ended up more than a point per game, more than his fair share of a huge moment for the Red Wings this season 
you can't really ask for more. You just hope that things kind of get easier for him moving on, on and off the ice, because that's what he deserves as a captain of the Red Wings. Lucas Raymond. I really should have saved Lucas Raymond because that's going to be the biggest story. And we'll talk about him later on in this conversation, but what a season for Lucas Raymond, 31 goals, 41 assists, played all 82, just turned 22 years old. This was the season where at the start of the year, we said as Raymond goes, Detroit goes. And I think that's what happened this year. The only Red Wings forward that got better as the year went on. And as the games got more important, you had guys like Patrick Kane who were pretty consistent all the way. Larkin obviously battled through injury, so not his fault, but Raymond's the one who elevated. Raymond's the one who was showing up the last six, seven weeks of the season when everybody else was either hurt or disappeared. You know, he's coming off of his sophomore slump where everybody's wondering, how good is he really? We know he's good, but is this like a 50, 60 point guy? Is this a 70 point guy? Is this a 90 point guy in the future? And he answered a lot of questions this year because... Unlike a lot of the forwards on this team, he was doing it when the competition ramped up, when it was the most important, when the checking was the tightest, when it mattered the most, when hockey gets harder is when he was at his best. No offense to JT Comfer. I really like JT Comfer. If you listen to the show, you'll know I'm a big fan of what JT Comfer brings. Lucas Raymond did a lot of this playing with JT Comfer or away from Dylan Larkin's line. And we'd seen the Red Wings ask him to do that in the past to free up that top line for, you know, Kane and Debrinket or in previous years, whoever else needed to be up there that Dylan Larkin had to try to elevate. And Lucas Raymond this year unlocked the ability to drive a line. We are seeing a play driving winger, which for a team that is lacking play driving centers, that is just a godsend. That is an absolute miracle from the heavens. Thank goodness for that draft pick because... Now Detroit has actual real options for a top six that can be dangerous. And if one of those lines doesn't have Dylan Larkin on it, it's okay. It buys you time if you want to look at the future of the Red Wings, which is, you know, how good can Nate Danielson be, for example. You're not asking him to necessarily drive play on that line. That's all just a hypothetical. But yeah, Lucas Raymond, we saw him be able to find space a lot better. What happened in his rookie season and his sophomore year, teams start to collapse around him, take away his time and space which forced him to kind of make decisions, play the game a little tougher on him. He really bulked up over the summer. I know the the meme was, oh, he added 12 pounds of muscle. You can actually see it. He got stronger on his skates. He got faster. He can find those soft spots better. He can create plays. He, the, he kind of almost demanded respect from his opponents with the puck on his stick, and he made you know high-end plays to distribute the puck as well. I actually think Lucas Raymond still has more potential to to lean on his shot and shoot even more confidently. And I hope that's something he works on this offseason. He scored 30 goals. I see no reason why he can't score 40. I, I think he could easily be a 40-40 guy for 80 points, if not more. Lucas, I, I'm not saying he is a faultless player, but this season, how many times were you really upset watching Lucas Raymond's game? Yeah, it's crazy to see sort of how much just, you know, bulking up in the gym has really unlocked the rest of his game. Just that alone, I think, you know, really helped build his confidence. And then you see all the skills you know he already has kind of flourish on the ice as the season progressed. I, It's very difficult to find any flaws in Lucas Raymond's season. He, For me, he is the MVP of the team, most improved as well. And he, he got better at the most important points of the season. I think he finished the season... In the last, I think in the last five games, he had, had 10 points. So he was carrying this team into the playoffs or to, to make it into the playoffs. I don't know. I think that I agree with you, Ryan. I think there's a lot more to Lucas Raymond, which is a very exciting thing for Red Wings fans. Something else that we didn't really talk about is, you know, there's, there's skill players and there's talent players and, and guys who can generate offense. But when you get to the NHL level, when that physicality comes, it's not just about being able to work around that physicality. It's be able to work in it. Lucas Raymond has always had a nose for the dirty areas. He gets in scrums. He's He doesn't shy away from that. But to be able to win battles, like how many times did we see him win a puck and make a play? Win a board battle. Beat a guy to a puck and hold him off with your body. Like he's, he's doing all of that. So yeah, it's a great point. And look at this stretch you, you prompted me to look, Evan. Last five games starting at April 9th against Washington, one point, Four points against Pittsburgh, one point against Toronto, two points against Montreal, one point against Montreal. Like that, for 
for all the conversation about who's going to show up in those big games, <laughs> those were the biggest games of the season, and he showed up in every one of them on that score sheet. Moving down the stat sheet here, Alex Debrinkit, first season with the Red Wings, played all 82, 27 goals, 40 assists for 67 points. 27 goals was about where we predicted, you know, a reasonable outcome for him would be that's not completely disappointing. Obviously, you would hope for a 30 goal season for him or more. But as we said, you know, getting adjusted to a new team, to a new system, it's not exactly a high octane offense, or at least that's what we predicted at the start of the year. It was about within range for Alex Debrinkit. But still at points, as you kind of alluded to, Brad, in the preamble, Alex Dabrinkit was streaky this year, and his shooting really disappeared at points, even if his overall play was, you know, doing the right things. Pick a two-week window, ask my opinion of Alex Dabrinkit, and you're going to get about 12 different answers throughout this season. That's the reality of it. You could see even when he wasn't performing at his best, why... He was the player who he was. It's not like he stopped making plays. It's not like he looked like William Nylander against Tampa on Wednesday. You could tell he was still mentally engaged. He seems to thrive and fail off his confidence. There were stretches. He just wouldn't shoot. He was looking for that extra pass every time. And it's like, my guy, you're an elite shooter. This is your thing. I don't care if you rip it from the blue line. You might create a rebound. It's better than overpassing even though his passing was very, very good. Again, much like the Red Wings season, you look at the end result and you're like, yeah, that's about what I was expecting. That's pretty good. Maybe hope for a little bit more, but overall I'm happy. It was just the inconsistency of it all. And, you know, he's at the age where I don't think that's going to work out of his game. I think that's just who he is. So all I'm hoping for is uh, he gets hot at the right times next year. I think another important thing with Alex Dabrinkit is he's a volume shooter. So I think as he gets better playmakers around him, I mean, he had Patrick Kane, so I don't know how much better it gets. But (laughs) as the quality of playmakers improves throughout the lineup, I think that should help him up his shooting percentage a little bit. Like he had 237 shots this year and 11.4% shooting. I think if he gets just a little bit more grade A opportunities from playmakers who, you know, defenders maybe thought it was going to be a shot, but gets over to Alex and he buries. I I really think, you know, we'll start to see a a big ramp up in the total goals and the finishing percentage. Yeah, I completely agree with both of you. Brad, you're right in that this is probably going to be part of his game to some degree. Hopefully as he settles in and becomes comfortable, it'll go away a little bit. And yeah, I mean, as the team gets better, you're going to elevate that, that aspect of it. So even if he does slump, It's not so pronounced, and it's not like he's the only guy who can score. So it's one of those things where it sounds obvious where, you know, if you surround a guy with better players and he's going to play better, but that's not a luxury Detroit has really had for the past, what, eight years. And now that they've gotten a sniff of that, you've seen the immense effects it's been able to have on Larkin and Raymond, and I think that's going to be the case for Dabrinkit, but it's now about adding that talent because if they lose Kane, you're not going to do much better than that even if it's a 35-year-old Kane, but... You have to have something there because I do worry about Debrinket kind of withering away if he doesn't have much. And it's never a good thing to have a guy who needs to be stapled to your best center. Like it's not the worst thing in the world because he does well there, relatively speaking. But if you don't have that versatility, then you lose a little. Your your line combinations are just a little too rigid, especially as injuries come up and you know a guy deserves a spot in the top line or whatever it might be. So. All in all, not a disappointing season for Alex Dabrinkit. I think it was good. I think we saw a lot of good things. And even when he kind of pulled out of his his slump of play, even if the scoring wasn't there, the playmaking was, the streakiness is something that he has to work on. Yeah, I think, you know, we got into, he didn't have an even strength goal for the month of January. Playoff teams can't have that. From one of your premier goal scorers, that's not acceptable. I think, you know, if he, if, like I said, you know, the playmaking throughout the lineup improves, I think those inconsistencies go like the long time slumps go away. You know, he'll still have game, those streaks where he goes six ish, six to 10 games without scoring, but those massive, massive months off of goal scoring just can't happen. Either that or we move the net over like a foot to the left. Yes. Okay. This is going to seem like a prank. If we could rewind time and play this next segment. For ourselves in September, October, we would think it's a prank. But Patrick Kane, 
in 50 games, 20 goals, 27 assists, 47 points. And it seems like every single one of those points was major, was hugely impactful, was on some kind of highlight reel or came at a big moment. And Patrick Kane proved a lot of people, including us, wrong when we were concerned about how he'd be able to come back from this hip resurfacing procedure. And he showed that really the only things holding him back are the normal effects of age and really needing a full off season to kind of build the muscle back up. But he looked a lot like someone who could still be a game changer and a needle mover out there. He came as exactly as advertised pre hip injury defensively. Don't uh, even know that word. He, the defensive zone is a theory to him. I, I understand what everybody was the saying. The Red have now. defensemen who have worse defensive zone coverage than Patrick Kane. That's not, but the, see, that's not a good thing for Patrick Kane. <laughs> that's not a, a celebration of Patrick Kane. This is defense. a glass half full, empty philosophical debate. You can decide which side you're on. Well, I've when, made up my mind. <laughs> well, when the bar is subterranean, there's only one way to go. That being said, when the puck was on his stick, he was electric. And it was on his stick so much. We didn't really care what was going on in the D zone when he, he was on the ice because it wasn't there a whole hell of a lot. I was surprised how good his goal scoring touch still was. Mm -hmm. We always knew the vision was there. We knew the passing was going to be there. We knew he could set up on the half wall, on the power play, never move his feet, just put him in cement in his spot. He'd still be effective. But he wasn't going to score from there. He didn't have a shot. He was never a scoring threat from that spot. And it didn't matter. It's it's incredible to watch the space the opposition would give him because they were so worried about him burning them with a pass. Yeah. We haven't they, Yeah, sorry, I'll let you finish your thought. Yeah, they as a to steal a football term, they drop into coverage. They're just like crap, crap, who's open, who's open, who's open, who's open. And then one guy moves, bang, pucks there, goal. Or they're so worried about the coverage, all of a sudden Kane goes, look at that nice lane to the net I have. Mm -hmm. Shame if I skated into it. <laughs> and it, it was remarkable. Again, exactly as advertised if you asked what you thought you were getting and it was like a 29-year-old Patrick Kane. And he did it at 35. Just insane. I don't think we ha the Red Wings have had anyone who feels makes the fans feel so at ease with the puck like Patrick Kane does since Pavel Datsuk. Yeah. And just the deception that he created, it just, it brought back the memories of the good old days, you know? It showed you what elite all-world hockey IQ was. And, I mean, Red Wings fans know they were spoiled. Nobody is surprised by the fact that the era that maybe died in about 2013, 2014 was going to be hard to look back at and compare yourself to based on what the Red Wings had after that. Like Red Wings fans know what they're missing and they know what they had, but still the feeling you're right, Evan, the feeling of watching someone with the puck on their stick and something magical happens almost every time where you kind of chuckle, you hear Mickey Redmond chuckle. The red other Red Wings players were in awe of it yeah. as well. There was an adjustment period where the, they just didn't know where to be. The power play got worse <laughs> when they got Patrick Kane because everyone was just watching him. It's like, no, you guys are on the same team. You need to move. It's crazy. But it, it goes to show you, you know, when people hammer their fists on the desk on this podcast about, you know, you need elite players. And even if it's hard to get, this is what the Red Wings are missing. And you're not mad at the Red Wings. You're mad at the draft lottery. But th this is what's holding the team back. This is why you have a 35 year old really washed up, like relatively speaking, he is nowhere near the player he used to be. And he still came in, was practically a point per game. And what, like if the Red Wings lose him, they're going to really, really miss him. And this is a guy who I don't think played at all in the defensive zone or won a single board battle or puck battle because he didn't even bother getting into them. Like he, that's just, you watch those players where they're like, nah, I'm not skidding back. Yeah. I'm not fighting for that puck along the boards. And you're like, how dare you? How good could you possibly be for that to be your MO on the ice? <laughs> as good as Patrick Kane is. Well, he doesn't have to get into board battles because when he has the puck, it's, yeah. it's his puck. It's it's a special kind of player. And even if he declines and even if that production goes down and even if he can't really move his feet and let's say the hips get worse over time and he only has like two halfway decent years left, it is still going to be someone that probably 32 teams would love to have on their team 
because he moves the needle. And something else I'll say about Patrick Kane and, and Gina Trotman from TV20 asked this, like, does he make an impact on the younger players? I think Patrick Kane had a huge impact on Lucas Raymond's emergence because players who have superstar potential, it's hard in the NHL to know what to do, to learn how to, how to play the game at the NHL level. It's what you do off the ice. It's how you practice. It's what you do kind of in games, between periods. All of that factors in. It's not about just going out there and – saying, ah, go get as many points as possible because you're exactly that good and that's your potential and you reach it. No, it's a very complicated thing. And how often have we seen the NHL superstar players or, or players with veteran experience coach those players up? And Lucas Raymond talked about watching Patrick Kane. I, I think we saw that effect this year. Lucas Raymond's greatest skill that he improved this year was manipulating how much time and space he had with the puck. Patrick Kane is a master at that. The master at that. You can't tell me that's a coincidence. An undersized forward gets significantly better at this one very specific trait that another guy on the team has been known for his entire career. It's either one of the greatest coincidences in hockey history or, yeah, Patrick Kane taught him a few things and he was able to learn, adjust, and use it. Also, like, uh, just the hilarity of us going from, oh, it's weird to see Patrick Kane in a Red Wings jersey to Patrick Kane yelling showtime at the Chicago fans <laughs> at the United Center wearing the winged wheel. I thought you had wiped that in the evening from your, your memory. No, I've embraced. You saw the 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 meme that kind of went out from the Discord about the Brad and I episode where we were talking about how optimistic it was. Yes. It's like, I think this is a playoff team. <laughs> Oops. So, what, what is it? Don't be sad that you lost it. Just be happy that it happened. Pretty much. It was the only week we've been happy in the entire history of this podcast. That I, is true. It was I, a I magical regret game. nothing. <laughs> and don't get don't get Brad and I wrong. There is some deep scar tissue. And even if the Red Wings have a hundred points, and there's still ten games to go, we are still not going to be optimistic now. But that was a glorious episode to live. That is what changed with that moment. It's not that I regret being that happy. I understood what the math was and the probabilities were at that time, and it was a very safe prediction. I think I even said on that episode, if they don't make the playoffs now, it's one of the greatest collapses in the salary cap era. And it was. And the only thing that saved them from getting labeled as the greatest collapse in the salary cap era was because Phillies was somehow worse. <laughs> but what it changed is next year, as Ryan said, and most of you listening are Lions fans. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. We know how this goes. Until they take that final kneel down in the fourth quarter, I'm celebrating nothing. The Red Wings could be nine points up with five games left. I understand that that math means someone could get ten points. We are not saying anything. We're learning new ways to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to move along through the offense a bit quicker now. A player who came in this season and we were all wondering how is he going to live up to this contract. JT Comfer signed a $5.1 million contract five years. So that it's a big deal and it was a lesser version but kind of a mirror version of Andrew Kopp. So a lot of people had some concern. But in my mind, JT Comfer was one of my more liked depth players for the Red Wings. And even though he wasn't exactly like a high-end number two center, 19 goals, 29 assists, and 48 points in in 77 games i think by all rights he was a good player for the red wings for most of the season he was and i mean this as a compliment capital f fine he did his role i don't think he exceeded expectations i don't think he was a disappointment i think the red wings got what they thought they were gonna get out of jt comfort he was just over 50 points last year with Colorado. Obviously, he was downgrading the team. So the fact that he was right up near 50 points with the weaker team is probably a pretty good sign. It's probably confirmation of he is who he is. And as long as he can hang on to that for another two to three years, I think everybody will be very happy. I think the team obviously believes in him as well. He almost averaged 20 minutes of ice every single night. Shooting percentage was pretty high, so I don't think he'll mimic that next year, but I'll always be pleasantly surprised if he does. Yeah, I don't think you can be too upset with JT Comfort's season. He was kind of the jack-of-all-trades, the utility knife that could play in all situations. I think from what you could expect from JT Comfort, he had, the, the, he had that season. 
David Perron, I think, was a player this season who had ups and downs. And I think especially to start the year, you wondered, is this the year he really declines? Uh, it was a little bit slower. You saw the foot speed go away. He got himself into to kind of tough positions and took bad penalties. And it was very pronounced at the start of the year. And, and the, the production wasn't there to the degree where you're like, oh, this is still really good from David Perron. I do think he turned that around. Some of those things that come with being an older player are still there. 17 goals, 30 assists, 47 points in 76 games is still good from Perron. He obviously missed games for high sticking someone in the face, <laughs> which seems like a, a century ago. But all in all, Perron, for being 35 years old, I still see a player who made a difference for these Red Wings. It wasn't completely unfrustrating. Like He was addicted to taking some pretty rough penalties at points, especially towards the, the end of the season. But for a guy who's vocal on the bench and in the locker room and that the team rallies around, you still saw him as a presence. If you want a team full of pricks, you got to be willing to accept a couple bad penalties throughout the year. And the timing on some of those were awful. But that's what you get with that type of player. And I'm okay with that. We have been talking about Florida all year, Tampa of years past. Not only were they good, they were a bunch of rats. Well, at least their assholes score 40 and 50 goals. (laughs) We understand there's some differences, Evan, but I'm trying to justify the penalties here. He was bad for stretches. He was great for stretches. The thing with Perron is, at this point in his career and his age, he is what he is. He's going to take those dumb penalties. He's going to get into a bunch of scrums. He's going to be, you know, a veteran leader who's showing the passion that you want. He can't skate. He never really could. He's exceptional along the wall with the puck. He's still got a good shot. I, he wouldn't be my trigger man on that spot on the power play anymore. But someone's got to do it. Might as well be him. I'd prefer they move him to a different role next year if he's back. But that's a conversation for next episode. And he can distribute the puck. Good shot. Good distributor. Pain in the ass. Can protect the puck along the wall like nobody else's business. Ask him to do nothing else of substance and you're going to be happy. If you want to play him in a bigger role than that then that's on you for not understanding what David Perron is. Should he be a second liner in the NHL anymore? Probably not. But given that he was legitimately the best option they had for it, he did fine. He definitely excels in the blue line and in type hockey. If the Red Wings played a run and gun riverboat gambling style of hockey, David Perron would stick out like a sore thumb and it would be tough to watch. But like you guys said, he's excellent in the small ice situations. I think he's one of the leaders in the room. And he sticks up for his teammates. And how many year recent years have we talked about how nobody backs each other up? And David Perron's one of the first guys in there. So, you know, obviously we'll talk about it next episode. But And it's got to be the money's right. But given this season, I think David Perron had a, had a fairly decent year. Some offensive zone and neutral zone penalties need to be cleaned up, and I'm sure that's probably part of his exit interview. But they need guys like David Perron who can still play the game and and help build the culture. All right, we're going to move a little quicker now through these next couple of players. I think the label of efficient score, they are what they are in the lineup, Robbie Fabry and Daniel Sprung. Tale of two tapes in terms of what their future is with the team. Fabry, 18 goals, 14 assists for 32 points in 68 games. Daniel Sprong, 18 goals and 25 assists for 43 points in 76 games. And I think, you know, Fabry is what he is. We know what Fabry is, and he's going to be playing down the lineup more than not, and he's going to be scoring probably a little bit more efficiently than typical guys down the lineup more than not. I think he knows how to find the net and get to the right place to to bang in those goals. I don't think it's necessarily all luck that he scores that efficiently. And that's Robbie Fabry. He signed for another season at $4 million, which is a touch rich. But, you know, Fabry's been on this team and that's what he brings. I I don't think there's a lot more to him other than that. I think Sprong is a a different story. An opportunistic goal scorer. Pretty much his calling card. He's not a guy who brings much of a defensive acumen, doesn't bring much of a physical game. I question when the wings are in their cup window if he's going to provide enough of a dimension down the lineup to be a fixture, especially for what he's getting paid. I don't know that he'll even be on the team. I I think he's a candidate to move. I think I agree. 
but he did what he was asked of him this year. You always like to see a little more, but to me, I watch his two bionic knees, and I'm always amazed that he's even doing <laughs> what he's doing. It's a miracle doing. of science. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Teach me, Robbie. <laughs> truly, truly a miracle he's even playing in the NHL at this point, and I'm not even saying that to be funny. He, he, he's, he was good. Again, I, I would like a more well-rounded player to score his 18 goals, but those aren't easy to find, so if you got a guy on your third line doing what he's doing, it's great. Daniel Sprong, I... I think everybody was aware what was happening down the stretch and boy, was it tough watching him the last four or five weeks of this season. You, you now understand why, despite all the goals, uh, a lot of teams gave up on him. Unfortunate as that is because the talent is real, but yeah, it was great. And then it wasn't. <laughs> I've never seen someone be so efficient with their time on the ice in terms of production. Yeah. And he has to be because he's, Otherwise, like I know it's not fun to say because you're like, wow, this guy scored 18 goals, 25 assists with that little ice, but he's a liability with the puck on his stick. And you don't blame him for missing the playoffs. Like the Red Wings lost twice to the Arizona Coyotes in a week. So that's, there's a lot of different things you can point to, but that giveaway against Pittsburgh that led to a goal is like the microcosm of exactly what the bad is that Sprung brings with the good. Heard a lot down the stretch from a few different sources that, you know, Sprung really didn't take well to being sat when he was asked to sit for his, you know, defensive woes or area responsibility to the puck. He didn't really like the fact that he felt like he was being, you know, punished more than other guys who made similar mistakes. He's and, not wrong about that. I'll give him that. And I think the team felt that he just wasn't getting it even after being sat. And it just like the attitude and the fit just isn't there. I don't think the fit in the room is necessarily there. I'd be really surprised to see Daniel Sprung come back. And yeah, there's, it's not often you find pretty much average 20 goals a year players move from team to team to team. And I think we're going to see him on a different team next year. Could be wrong. Lots of things can change. Detroit's going to have to replace some offense in all likelihood this season. So you never know, but Another year where Daniel Sprung, what, he averaged 12 minutes of ice. This is going to be a contentious player and one that's worth talking about, of course, but Andrew Kopp's season was not what we were expecting or hoping for after a season initially in Detroit that was mired by coming back from a core surgery and it was a little bit up and down. Andrew Kopp had 13 goals, 20 assists for 33 points and still obviously has that big contract and at points factored into a really effective shutdown line, but also for a lot of the season had a lot of Red Wings fans wondering how bad is this contract? It's awful. It might be the worst one on the team. That's not his fault. That's what the organization chose to pay him. And just like we always used to say with Abdelgator, don't hate the player, hate the contract. <laughs> we love Abby. We would never sign that contract. Same thing with Andrew Kopp. I like Andrew Kopp. He's a good bottom six shutdown forward. You don't pay north of $5 million. I know I saw his exit interview where he said he was asked for his role to be reduced. And there, it kind of had that undertone of, hey, I can score more. Just give me more of an opportunity to which I would respond. Andrew, you've had two full years with this team. We haven't seen it. That's the most goals he's scored in three years. Yeah, like, sure, you may have more goal scoring to you, but we might never see it. What we know is you can be a capable two-way forward. Is that worth your contract? Absolutely not. Not even close. But if that's the most effective way to use him, so be it. If you have to pay $5 million for a fourth-line center, so be it. If it's a good fourth-line center, great. You're not saying sign them for that. You're saying if that's what you have and that's the optimal spot in the lineup, then yeah. If that is the most effective use of him, so be it, and you just eat the money. They can't get rid of the money now unless they buy him out. Nobody's touching that contract if you trade him, and the premium you'd have to give up would be insane. So it's you're stuck with him or you're buying him out. And I think it's probably too early for a buyout. Again, we'll get into that, but yeah, it the whole contract is disappointing. You know, like Rasmussen, I think we just have to shift what the expectations are at this point because he's not scoring 20 goals ever again. That'd be a miracle after watching these past two seasons. If he can go out, win his minutes, be a neutral, great. 
because I, I he's okay at doing that. I wouldn't call him elite at that either. That's the the real problem of it. He's good defensively, but he's not some Patrice Bergeron selkie candidate. Like I think when someone's so deficient offensively, their defense gets elevated if they're labeled as a two way. It's a reminder he's good, not great. The Sherratt situation this year is, I think, a good indication of how you just forget about what you're paying a guy and you play him appropriately, and and the the results can come and will come. And so I think that's what gives me hope that the whole the heat on Andrew Cop can be simmered down a little bit because you can probably slot him appropriately. And that's what the Red Wings ended up doing. Like you're right, Brad. He said, you know, I can do more. The Red Wings just started slotting him more appropriately, and that, that's all it is. At the end of the day, it's a pretty simple answer. Overpaid on price, 5.625 is far too much money on the cap. Overpaid on term. But for what they're asking him to do now on the ice, it's fine. And it's an unfortunate situation and probably a a contract at some point they're going to have to try to figure out something about. Maybe we'll see how it goes. I I agree that it's probably a little too early on the buyout, but that will be a conversation. This is a contract where the Red Wings are going to have to live with it. And Eiserman is going to have to look at what went into signing that one and making sure it's, it just doesn't happen again because you can't have too many of these on your roster. Okay, moving on. I think you look at Cop, then you also have to consider Fisher and Rasmussen. And Fisher is an easy one. I think he was brought in as a free agent. You know, that kind of 12th, 13th forward kind of guy brings some muscle, brings a not complete inability to do something with the puck, but also just it's more the physicality and the shutdown role. And I think you saw why Arizona fans... Utah fans loved Christian Fisher. I'd be happy to see him back on a, a minimum contract next season. Yeah, if the guy's making basically a million bucks to be a fourth line shutdown guy and he's effective at that, fantastic. And that's what he was this year. Michael Rasmussen ended the season injured. I I had heard that the injury was significant enough where if the Red Wings made the playoffs, it wasn't even guaranteed that he'd be in, maybe. But he was saying that he would have potentially been ready. In any case, hard to lose him, but still played 75 games, 13 goals, 20 assists, 33 points. Down and up a year for Rasmussen, but I think he found his form as the season kind of went on from the, that starting phase. If you follow Rasmussen's season, it, it kind of feels like he went with the team. Now, you can look at this two ways. Either he went with the team because he was relying on the team, or he's the linchpin of this team. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. When he when he broke his kneecap last year, the Red Wings really missed him. Again, much like Andrew Kopp, if you focus on what he is and not what you want him to be, you're going to be very happy with Michael Rasmussen. If you still think he has another gear or more offense to give, you're going to be sadly mistaken. If he can flirt with a half a point per game, Playing on the third line, you know, being that big, heavy presence down low, using his reach and his IQ to be effective defensively and on the penalty kill. And, you know, because of his skating and his size, get a bunch of pucks to the net. You're happy. He's got almost no playmaking dimension to his game. Not much of a sniper, but he's this six foot five, six, whatever he is, who can skate. And who can kill penalties? There's value to that. So he's younger than Cop. He's cheaper than Cop. But he's probably going to be playing the exact same role. And he's probably a little better at it. So, again, if you are aware of what Michael Rasmussen is, he's going to be one of your favorite players on the team. And I went into this season with the expectation of this is what he's going to be. That's what what he was. I'm thrilled. It's great. Speaking of Andrew Cop. They actually both, him and Michael Rasmussen had the same stat line. They both had 13 goals, 20 assists for 33 points. Rasmussen just happened to do it in four less games and one minute less average ice time per night. Good for you, Ras. And about half the money. (laughs) And last one here, Joe Valeno, before we jump into a quick break. 80 games played, 12 goals, 16 assists, 28 points. There were times where Joe Valeno was, I think, really kind of showing that he was ramping up his ability to contribute on the ice. There's times where he looked a little bit invisible or maybe was reverting back to some of the things that the teams didn't love. But all in all, I think a not insignificant step forward for Joe Valeno. Joe Valeno might be the poster child for the last five or six guys we talked about where we can say, yeah, you started great. And then what the hell happened? I don't think Valeno was 
bad down the stretch. Yeah, just a little. Invisible. But I don't think I said his name since February. He was just a guy out there. And again, for a fourth line center, perfectly acceptable. I think we were all hoping Valeno would maybe ascend to something beyond that. We've seen flashes in his skill where you it makes you think, yeah, this this guy might be a dude. But it just did not go the right way as the season was progressing. An RFA with arbitration rights. I'll be interested to see what happens with Valeno. All right, we're going to be back after a quick break to talk about the defense. But first, we want to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older and as always, enjoy responsibly. Okay, the defense. Ouch. (laughs) Wasn't good all year. Let's not sugarcoat it. The the defense at its best was when Detroit didn't have to play insanely offensively talented teams and Moritz Sider could breathe for a damn minute and they were a little bit healthy or or whatever. But by and large, the defense was the most consistent problem for this team all year. And you would have been able to predict that looking at the roster. Like it just was not a surprise. Mort Sider had, you know, analytically probably one of his worst seasons of the year, but all the year we were kind of having this big argument where it was like the Red Wings fan base and media and people who covered the team and watched all 82 games just trying to, you're almost pleading a case for Mo Sider to say, yeah, he hasn't been perfect, but he has by far the hardest deployment in terms of defensive zone starts, in terms of quality of competition, in terms of who his partner is, whatever. Out of anyone in the league, it feels like. And it turns out it is by a country mile more than anyone else in the NHL. Mo Sider played the hardest minutes in situations, bar none. And he play, he's playing that on his ELC. And he was the best Detroit had all year. You left out one part of that. He had the hardest deployment of anybody in the NHL. Going back to when they started tracking that in 2009 or whenever it was. It wasn't just this season. Yeah. It was historic. And he was good. I don't care what the analytics said. He was good. He was really good this year. He scored nine goals and 33 assists for 42 points. I, I, with how the season was going, I was like, we might see an exceptionally down year for him offensively because it's really hard to contribute with the kind of deployment he had, but he still had a presence out there. And, you know, we get quite a few messages about Mo Sider and a lot of folks are wondering, like, they'll say, why do you seem to give him a pass or a break? Or he made this mistake and... Not that most Sider is faultless, but... His mistakes per 60 is a lot lower. And, yeah, and, like, you also consider how tough his situations are. If you look at players of his age playing that position, how many players his age are, are the team's number one defenseman? How many of them have ever played that quality of competition? The answer is none, as Brad just pointed out. You put that all on balance, this is a player who can do way more way more in a better defense and you almost like that has to be the biggest focus like yes we're scared about what happens if the Red Wings lose all these goals on offense this offseason but if you don't get Mo Sider some help like you really you really have to make sure you're not playing with fire here with his development because he needs help out there when Mo Sider spends every shift of his season playing against Crosby, McDavid, McKinnon, Jack Hughes, Kucherov, pick whatever star of the team they're playing against, he's going to get turnstiled a couple times. And then when you go look down the defense and you see, you know, whatever number four or five defenseman getting turnstiled by Noel Achari, yeah, we're not going to treat those as the same. Yeah. And that's the reality of the situation. He was playing huge minutes against elite competition 
without a lot of help from the forwards in his own zone. It was fine. He did great. I would like to see Mo Sider freed up to do things better offensively. I would like to see him be a little bit more physical and in, engage with some more, you know, exciting hits. And that's just the Neanderthal in me. And I'd also like to see him be able to to have trust in the play around him to be able to step up and make some more, you know, blue line stops to stop the play from entering the zone. That's a, a skill I think he has that we saw on display a little bit less this season. But yeah, all in all, the focus has to be on, on getting Mo Sider helped so we can see the player that he actually is. I think for me, his this is probably one of the best seasons he's had, period. For all the things you guys said, I think for me, he's one of the guys who will have the biggest increase as the players around him improve. Not only from the defensive players being added, but also the forwards as well. If he can get an elite, a couple more elite centermen to kind of ease the burden as well, I think that would be a huge boon for him. Well, Evan, I got some bad news for you next episode. Yeah, well, (laughs) spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. So I agree with you, Ryan. I think the one thing I would like to see come back to Moritz Sider's game is for him to be at least perceive himself as the guy out there that, you know, sort of cocky level of confidence he he had, you know, taking the puck from Hedman during a, a stoppage in play, running guys over. But I think he... sort of got away from that this year because he knew if he put himself out of position, oh, there yeah. was nobody saving James Reimer and Alex Lyon and Alex Lyon. So I think as the team improves, that will free up more, more insider to return to form in that aspect. But looking at his, ent- the entirety of this season, I think he had an amazing season. Shane Goss's bear is a player who we're not sure will return. I think the money might be a bit rich. He came really as advertised in the best and worst of ways. Incredibly gifted offensive player who can factor in. Defensively, you can't rely on him. And that's what we saw with Shane Goss's bear. 10 goals, 46 assists, 56 points in 81 games. It'll be hard to replace him, but I think this is a guy that's going to get paid in the offseason. I think there's a room for him on the Red Wings, but also, you know, you need a little bit more stability at that second pair right D to be able to play defense. Good player. Great player for the Red Wings, I think, most of the season, though. He had his points where he disappeared and didn't really do much at even strength that we were monitoring for a while. But what he brings offensively and on the power play is you you can't overlook that. I didn't notice Goss Despair's significant defensive woes all that often. Obviously, he's not elite back there but he was competent and when you have a guy who can run your power play one and put up over 50 points from the back end if he's not a giant liability in his own end that is a huge plus for your team and the red wings power play this year was good and i think cost despair was one of the biggest reasons for that Mm -hmm. a player who had a turnaround this season ben trot and anytime we said we had uh, that we thought he had a turnaround people kind of push back on it and i want to clarify like this is one of those gray areas ben Sherratt last season was like that the red wings were trying to slot him too high up in the lineup they were asking to do too much and he just wasn't performing anywhere near his contract and and throw his contract out the window for a second i think ben Sherratt brought a lot more stability this year for two reasons one i think he actually turned his game around a lot less of the wild card liability all over the ice kind of play that you saw him put himself out of position a lot the season previous and the Red Wings gave him a lot more appropriate matchups, deployments, time on ice, the ability to kind of let himself out as that kind of player. There was a a lot of points over the course of the year where it was like Cider, Wallman, and, you know, maybe one or two other guys who were plus defensemen for the Red Wings in terms of their performance on the ice any given game. And and Sherratt was there quite a bit. Here's how Ben Sherratt makes you happy. You put him on the second pair and you don't look at what he makes. That's that's it. He's He tried doing way too much last year. He simplified his game this year. He was deployed in a smaller role and he did very well in it. Just don't look at the AAV next to his name. Just look at him as a solid number four defenseman and you'll be perfectly happy. I'm sure there's lots of moments in the season that people could pick apart, like, oh, here's Ben Sherratt getting walked. Here's Ben Sherratt behind the goal, the other team's goal line. He actually had a career high in block shots this year, so I think from a defensive perspective, he actually had a better season. You know, I still don't like the the total package that Ben Sherratt brings to the ice, 
But man, there are some moments where I'm like, why does a bed shot do this all the time? <laughs> There's like small ice situations where he's an excellent defender or he keeps a tough puck in at the blue line and evades off the, the four check. It's just the consistency or the inconsistency of those moments that give me pause, but I'm past the Ben Sherratt bashing bashing. I should call it, you know, now that we're another season through of, of witnessing what Ben Sherratt is, um, I'm at peace with it. Packaging these guys up, Justin Hall, Oli Mata, Jeff Petrie. Uh, Hole, I'm going to give a DNF. <laughs> Straight to jail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you think about guys who, like, they didn't offer themselves that contract. They took it, just never should have been signed. The guy wasn't even playable at the end, according to the team. And I actually don't think that was necessarily the wrong decision. There's left right handedness in there. But yeah, that. How are you going to sign the guy to that contract? He doesn't even play down the stretch. He wasn't exactly good when he did play. At best, he was invisible. That's Justin Hall. It was a mistake, plain and simple. Huge mistake from day one. Ole Mata, I'll give the, yeah, this is definitely a guy award too. He he was there. Uh, uh, according to the stat sheet, according to the roster, I almost never noticed him. Very, for defense, that might be good. <laughs> for this iteration of the Red Wings defense, I, I mean it as a compliment. I almost never noticed him out there for good or bad reasons. I think he did struggle a little bit. Like, I think last year he brought a lot more stability than this season. He had points where he really struggled. Like, there were, there were multiple examples of, like, his gap control one-on-one. I'm like, he's about to get cooked. He's about to get cooked. Well, he and he got cooked. He can't skate. And, he never could. Right. But I, he was able to kind of mitigate that. I do think he kind of found his his game a little bit more and you also get like those three four game stretches where he's just like always below the other team's hash marks trying to make things happen offensively which is really funny didn't he score a rebound goal this year yeah he's just a <laughs> you know i was watching a game with someone once and they were like why is only detroit got scored on they're like why is only Mata the last red wing back my god like, oh, he's he's on one of those little offensive tears he's, you just don't understand the artist and the artistry <laughs> it's <laughs> like Oli Mata's version of the purge. He just he just has to get it out of his system every once in a while, and then he's good for another month or two in his own zone. Jeff Petrie is the ultimate example of yes, you you can be mad at how bad he's playing, but you also have to point to not just the coaching but the management because when there were injuries or other players couldn't be trusted, Detroit didn't have much other choice at second pair right D than Jeff Petrie, which is far too high of a slot. We all know how low those lows got, and it's not a coincidence that once the team got healthier and was able to slot him down in the third pair, you actually didn't hear people complaining about him a lot, and there was actually moments where he was decent. Jeff Petrie is fine as a 6-7 guy, but when they needed him as a 3-4 guy, oh, it got ugly. Jeff Petrie is this year's Detroit Red Wings award winner of the Wildcard Bitches Yeehaw Award. He's the Ben Sherratt <laughs> Trophy <laughs> recipient. Yes. Uh, other formerly known as the Mark Stahl Award. I just, oh man. Uh, we've been through a lot of. <laughs> we keep doing the same thing and we're confused why it doesn't work. Formerly, formerly known as the Brendan Smith Award. <laughs> I'll say like there was when, when the Hall contract was signed, I really had to dig deep to try to, to find, you know, how this could fit. And the Sherratt contract had a lot of concerns. I actually thought Petrie wouldn't have had a fall off as steep as he did. And I also do think the hate towards him was kind of exaggerated and was missing the context of, again, the Red Wings were just asking him to slot up higher than he should have been. If they if they can keep him as a six seven guy next season, I actually don't care. I'm at peace with it. If you see him on the second pair, that's a problem. He has a modified NTC and a no move clause, so he's gonna be on the team next year. Everybody just needs to accept that now. There's a lot of work to be done around him, but yes, if he is your number six seven right handed D, it's fine. It's okay. Don't expect a lot. If he gets on the ice against the other team's top six forwards at any point, bad things are going to happen, but he can still keep up with the bottom six forwards. So deploy him as such. A player who's, you know, a, a lot of the season was staple to Mo Sider and you thought, okay, that's Detroit's, you know, first pair left side defenseman. Is it the ideal one? No, but he's, he's doing fine enough there. And then as injuries kind of stacked up, Jake Wallman's season kind of got derailed. Didn't play towards the end. I think there was a lot of questions that came in about Jake Wallman. A little bit of a, 
a hazy space, I think, intentionally from the team. The impression you got from watching him and, and from what we've heard, like that's a guy who's injured very obviously. He tried to come back, wasn't 100%. If they needed him to go, maybe he could have, but by and large, the team just wasn't ready to put him out there. Up and down year for Wallman. One of the few Red Wings defenders who can actually keep up on that pairing with Mo Sider. One of the better Red Wings defenders in terms of gap control and defending off the rush because as a unit, that was a huge problem for them this year and he was one of the few guys who was adequate. Finally really started to utilize that absolute bomb of a shot he has this year. Not much of a playmaking defenseman, but good outlet pass. The injuries caught up to him. Like you factor everything in, he's he's a complimentary defenseman, and he plays the role well. If he's, I think ideally next season you have him on the second pair. I really do think Simon Edvinson, which we'll get into, will be the first pair left side defenseman before long. That's not bad at all. That's not bad at all. You just have to hope that he gets healthy and can have a consistent season. He he still played sixty three games, but Detroit really missed a a high end Jake Wallman down the stretch. I know I'm an old boomer, but I actually think Jake Wallman is is great entertainment for hockey. I know he does the gritty and stuff like that, and I'm old. I don't understand it at all, but I know the kids love it, and I know it's something marketable. So I got all the time in the world for Jake Wallman. Oh, you saw when he won and did the gritty, and then you, you like they're walking down the tunnel. Like when that guy's in the room and playing his game, like he's the life of the room. You talk about Perron as a leader. Kane is also a very vocal player on the bench and in the room. But it, guys who kind of bring the fun and the energy, Jake Wallman brings a lot. And that, it's you don't have to dig deep to find that. You just watch any kind of video of those guys. Simon Edvinson, who. Look, I hedge and I I qualify and I play the middle ground on a lot of what we say because, you know, there's no absolute right and absolute wrong in this in this space. Simon Edvinson should have been up all year, man. He was good. He was so good when they called him up. Was he perfect? No, he that's his, but that's an NHL player and I think next year he's going to have a he, he has a chance to have a fantastic season. He finally got the permanent call up towards the end of the year and he looked great out there. I think he looked really good. I'm going to say something really stupid. The oh, way, tune in, folks. <laughs> stare in the camera. Here we go. The way he controls the puck under pressure gives me massive Victor Hedman vibes. I That is the stupidest thing I've ever said, probably. Well, today, at least. <laughs> but, man, he is cool as a cucumber when the puck is on his stick and a, a four-checker is breathing down his neck. That's all I had to say. <laughs> After you, I didn't know what was going to come after. It gave you massive, and then I thought, oh boy, this Uh-oh. might be an edit. <laughs> yeah, the fingers hovering over <laughs> that button right there. Edmondson was really, really good. His calmness with the puck almost got him into trouble a few times. Doesn't count. If it's almost, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, but that's what I mean. It's There's moments where you said earlier, you when talking about Patrick Kane, you are so calm and comfortable when Patrick Kane has the puck on his stick. I'm almost the exact opposite of that with Simon Edmondson, but he does it so well with a guy just hanging off him that you're like, okay, that worked out. I definitely didn't think that was going to work out, but it does every time. So it's a huge strength of his. And again, one of the few wings who's able to defend adequately, consistently off the rush, which he's not even that great at it yet, but he's getting better and there's lots of room for improvement. I know we'll talk about it next episode, projections. Yeah, he can play anywhere in the lineup you want him to. He's that good. And it's not going to be a question of, is he a top two, three defenseman? It's where do you maximize his value in the lineup, which is a testament to how good he was at the age he is. The things I really like I saw from him weren't just the stuff that we knew were his strengths when he was drafted. It's what we were concerned about when we said this guy could be potentially boom or bust. And one of them is what you two just talked about. And Brad, I remember you pointing to, he makes good decisions with the puck, but it seems like at the level he was playing at, it didn't come with pace. He thinks the game well, but can he execute at pace? And what we saw from him was the ability to do that this season relatively quicker than where he was when he was drafted, which means the improvement has come. We've seen that improvement across his game. And for guys who weren't, you know, more surefire stars, like we saw Mo Sider blew everyone's socks off pretty much from the moment he was drafted and then in his first season. And we knew Lucas Raymond had this kind of potential. But when you get into the later picks, the Edvinsons, the Caspers, etc., 
those question marks are naturally going to be there based on where they were picked. And Edvinson's done a lot of really good things already with Grand Rapids and now Detroit to dispel some of those concerns. So with the improvement I'm seeing, I agree. I think he can play up and down this lineup next year in terms of the defensive pairings. And that is a very, very promising return for Detroit. They're going to have questions to answer next season. They're not going to be cheap or easy to answer, but one of them is free. He's in your organization. He's giant and he's got a left-handed shot. So maybe he ends up with Mo Sider. The goaltending. Feast or famine? Alex Lyon, James Reimer, different flavors, same overall results. Alex Lyon was either saving everything or made no above average saves. And that's what you got from him. James Reimer was the best save you've ever seen or holy shit, James, get back in your net. What are you doing here? Goaltending. It was absolute chaos goalie for Reimer, not so much for Lyon, but both of them put up similar results at their peaks and at their, their valleys. I think Lyon demonstrated the ability to do a little bit more, a little bit more consistently, but he played 44 games. He doesn't strike me as a 44 game goalie. He strikes me as a 30, 35 game guy and not a guy who should be starting six, seven games in a row. So Detroit and Vili Husso was hurt all year. He played 19 games and looked bad in most of them. So Detroit has a lot of really not great 1A options in net. Well, this was arguably the team's biggest flaw this season. Alex Lyon went on a heater. January and February, and it it's probably the main reason they got as close to the playoffs as they did. The goaltending was basically bad the rest of the year. Reimer could not string together more than two good starts. Even in some of his quote-unquote better starts, man, it sure looked like the puck was just hitting him, and he was surprised when it did. Lion, yeah, I'm with you. If you want to bring him back as like a 30-game backup, and he's got Absolutely. a year left on his contract yeah. at very little money. So yeah, so he's he's back, that. barring a trade. I I would love him in that role. I don't trust Huso's health to be a starter. I don't trust James Reimer to be an NHL goalie at this point. It's the biggest question mark for me going into the offseason, and it was the biggest weakness of the team this season. I figured one of the three goalies would really take the reins. More so leaning towards Billy Huso continuing his emergence as a starter, but we clearly didn't see that. Lyon was doing Lyon things for the Red Wings this year that he did with Florida last year. Just helps that Florida is a Stanley Cup contender and could shelter him a little bit better. And then well, there's nothing really I need to rehash on James Reimer. Everybody witnessed it. It was chaotic neutral at best. So... I agree with you, Brad. My biggest question mark is what happens next year, and we'll cover that on Wednesday. The short term, I don't know. Long term, I'm I'm happy. Yeah, because you have Kosa and Augustine potentially exactly. as the answer. So for me, I, I know Vili Husso said that he, he doesn't expect to need surgery and he expects to be healthy next season. And that's Detroit's worst case scenario that they'll have Husso and Lyon and whatever other shot in the dark that they take next year. It doesn't inspire confidence. Huso, before he went down, didn't look great. You're not going to judge a guy's whole career by, you know, a 15-game stretch, but I don't know. I, I think if you want to be serious about trying to keep 91 points as your floor next year, you're going to need more certainty in net. Lyon's not young. I think this is, is what he is as a goalie, and that's – most playoff teams would love to have Lyon as their backup. That'd be a phenomenal backup. You get away with playing Alex Lyon 30 games, oh, President's trophy teams would have that, but Detroit needs a serious option. So yeah, good way to put it, Evan. Short term, yeah. big question marks. Medium to long term, there's some answers potentially in the organization. All in all, uh, the Red Wings went as their goaltending did this season, though. Like the goaltending bailed them out and pulled them out of that ugly December where January, February they were able to get things done, and when the Red Wings needed the most in March, they just weren't there. I don't think Reimer's back next year, but we'll talk about that later on. All right. Uh, management, coaching, the administration. How do you feel? I know Derek Lalonde had a lot of heat on him from the fan base this season. Steve Eisman's getting the first semblance of real kind of heat from a, a growing part of the fan base this season at a largely quiet deadline. I know uh, for me, my answer a lot of times when it was, why is Derek Lowe not getting more heat? And my answer was, well, if you're mad at him for playing Jeff Petrie on the second pair, for example, you have to be mad at Steve Eisman for giving him Jeff Petrie as a second pair right defenseman. So 
those were, it was a little bit of a change of tone for this administration, we'll call it. Thoughts on the season overall? Whoa, time out, time out, time out. It's just a demonstration. We don't actually have to pause here. I just need to let Derek know he can do that. <laughs> you and Evan, man, you're never going to drop this bit. <laughs> that being said, I'll I'll start with alone. I actually did like the season from him with the, the lack of timeouts bit aside. There were some pretty big red flags, um, mainly the team never starting on time. They, this was a team that battled their ass off for most of the season outside of March, but it was a consistent issue. They were flat in the first period a lot. And then they would, at some point in the game, be shot out of a cannon. Don't know why, don't know how that works. Not in that room, but that is something I hope he can fix. I think, yeah, if you want to get mad at his defensive systems, well, he didn't really have any defensemen who could deploy it. There were some questionable deployment again, but that's probably more of a roster thing, even though, he probably still shouldn't be playing Jeff Petrie on the second pair for as long as he did. Yeah, I was, I, I would say I'm on the good side of neutral with how I view Lalone's season. There were no significant red flags, but also there weren't like a whole lot of overwhelming successes where I can go, this is where the coach made a huge difference. But I also look at it and go, I can't really pinpoint where the coach cost this team games. Again, with Eisenman, if you look at the roster he built for this season, bigger question marks there. I think all those bad contracts he signed to mediocre players and even like okay players who were just overpaid, it caught up to him this year because you could see the roster jam they were in. A lot of guys were playing well above what they should be because they were getting paid well above what they should be. The Debrinka trade seemed to work out well. I think if we could all go back in time and, and redo that trade, everybody would. If everybody could go back in time and sign Patrick Kane again, everybody would. I don't think anybody would have approached the goaltending the same way he did. I don't think Justin Hull gets that contract. I don't think a couple other guys get their contracts. But a lot of the stop gaps that he did sign, Shane Goss's bear, Nearly Daniel 60 Sprong, points, yeah. yeah, Christian Fisher worked out very, very well. It's weird. On the big swings he made, he did well. On the one-year deals that he you know, signed to fill holes, did very well. It was those middle players that he gave term to that really nuked this team. I think, like, we had the, I know it was very yelly, like we were having a lot of fun in our previous Patreon-exclusive overtime episode. For, for the patrons, go back and listen to that one. I know it's long. But there's, a, like, a lot of, I think, warranted but maybe not fairly targeted you know constructive criticisms of of the team and how management and coaching has handled things but by and large you're you're still seeing like i think any mistakes that you point to from the coaching or especially the management steve eisman it is like a normal amount of errors to make some of them i wish weren't made like they felt preventable but by and large you went in and brought patrick kane the different pieces you added as you mentioned brad made you practically a, a playoff contending team in this version of the NHL this season. So all in all, it was still a step forward. It was still an improvement. I'm not a fire the coach quick kind of guy. So I, I'm not going to base one month off of my opinion. So I agree. I'm, I'm much more positive on Derek Lalonde than I think some people are, but yeah, it was, it was one of those seasons where you did some really good things and it also highlighted what needs to change next season. Because you really can't afford any more blunders with term as the cap's going to get tighter as Raymond and Sider get raises. And you also have to understand what you need to do to make this team competitive. All that said, like this might have a negative tone. Don't forget, Steve Eisman came in here with no draft lottery wins when a lot of years, you know, Detroit quote unquote deserved it. No elite players handed to him. A lot of roster and, and contract, you know, screw ups to undo. And this team has come a long way since then. So it, it's a frustrating process, yes. But I think this year was a, a learning year. And it wasn't mistake-free. But still, all in all, good in my mind. I think I echo a lot of what you guys said. I think the biggest gripes I had, obviously, with the coaching staff are the prevent defense continues to not work. They continue to try it. And they continue to fail most of the time at that. And as much as People are happy that the Red Wings are the comeback kids. I would prefer if the team was trailing less and required comebacks far less often. 
with all that being said, you know, the Red Wings were top 10 in scoring. Their power play was was good this season. You know, defense, the defensive metrics obviously left a lot to be desired, but we just talked about the defense, so I think that answers the question. So from a coaching perspective, I, you know, I thought it was a, a decent year for Derek Lalonde and the coaching staff, and I'm certainly not part of the fire or change, make a change for the coaching staff at this point. I think you got to, we gave Jeff Blaschel, what, five years? More. This this conversation shouldn't even be coming up. And then I agree with what you guys said about the Steve Eisenman moves. The the ones with term haven't worked out. The short-term ones filled the stop gaps this year. Now he's got to figure out how to continue with next year as guys in Grand Rapids start to age out and have to be moved up. The, the transition into like trends over the course of the season that we saw is I think a lot of a, an explanation for a lot of like the, the feelings on coaching staff and the trade deadline, for example, because going into the trade deadline, our sentiment was you shouldn't really do much unless you can get a guy at a great price. It just, there wasn't a lot out there. You shouldn't really be doing much. And that's not what Eisenman did. If March didn't go as it did, I think a lot of people wouldn't have felt the same way about, you know, Eisenman not adding a lot. Yeah, you would have loved to have added like a Hannafin, for example. I don't know if he even would have signed in Detroit long term, but you would have wanted to maybe fix something on defense. But that's all stuff that can happen in the offseason. That Larkin injury at the same time as the goalie is going cold and at the same time as this illness that swept through the room and it didn't do it all at once. It stretched over weeks and weeks and weeks and even into April. Mo Sider played 82 games, but just barely. He was in the hospital for with a, a really bad bug and still played that day. You know, whatever it was, dehydration or whatever it might be. Like I asked around about the the flu when it was first happening, and it got basically I got told, like, it's not no, that's not an excuse for how we're playing. And I thought, okay, that's fair. If that's coming from the team, then you know, they're the ones to say it, and they would have every reason to say, hey, we're really suffering out here. But as the season went on, like you heard more and more stories of guys puking between periods or, you know, Cider being in the hospital before a game or this guy's under the weather and he's a game time decision. Like, I really think that had a much bigger impact than even the team was letting on. And I think they just didn't want to use it as an excuse because you don't want a loser mentality. You don't want to go out there and say like, oh, that's why we didn't start on time or that's why, you know, we made this obvious mistake. Because I don't think it was all they were sick and injured. I think they also played like crap. But I, I do think that really derailed their season at the wrong time where there was this big confluence of unfortunate events. Anyhow, that was the the obvious trend where if you look back at why Detroit missed, you look at March. But all in all, overall thoughts, how did this team perform relative to your expectations coming into the season? You can use all context, how they got there. How do you feel now at the end of the year? Success, otherwise, where are you at? Where I fall is the parts of this season that make me the most optimistic came from the players that we needed to see the most from, the ones who are most relevant to the future of the Red Wings. Larkin, guy's a star, no questions. There's no more questions about Dylan Larkin. This guy's the number one center. He's sick. End of statement. Lucas Raymond, guy's going to be a star. He's a star already. Guy could be a superstar. The the sky's the limit for Lucas Raymond, which is awesome. Mo Sider handled the toughest minutes anybody has ever seen, at least in modern recent NHL history. Edvinson came up fantastic, phenomenal. Those are the guys that mattered the most this year, and nobody's coming away with this season with any questions about any of them. It's it's perfect. I think guys have been really put this team in a bad spot with some of the contracts he signed and he's going to have an interesting off season to solve that. And most of my disappointment came from that section of the team. But again, if you take the AAV away, Comfort was good. Schrott was good. They found a role that can work for cop, which is good because for short term, those were all important details. Depth players on this team, not to sound crass, who cares? It is what it is. The defense, terrible. But again, the guys we actually care about for the cup window, which there's only three of them. Great. Sider, Wallman, Edvinson, no complaints here. So 
overall, the season was disappointing just because of the gap they had built. And I understand that when they had that eight point lead in the playoffs, PDO bender goalie got hot shooting percentage, got a little unsustainable. I understand all that, but they were there. I understand Larkin got hurt, but that collapse was a little inexcusable. They showed good resolve down the stretch. That, those last four games of absolute mayhem. Most fun I've had watching the Red Wings in years. It was crazy. I wanted to rip my eyes out and do a backflip at several points through each of those four games. It was phenomenal theater, and, and you could tell the team, like, gave a shit. Not just a little. They were all in. They were invested. And then you see how crushed they were in the postseason interviews. Good. That's great to see. Mm -hmm. It sucks that they're upset and you hate seeing them like that. But, oh, man, they were all in and you know they're going to use that going into next season. That's the part for me is I think, you know, based on expectations for this season, you have to be happy with 91 points. I'm not saying that because that's, you know, what I predicted. I think those 91 points came in a year where, you know, Ottawa and Buffalo were less competitive than I would have predicted. But yeah, I'm overall, I'm pleased with the result. I'm pleased with the things that you said, Brad, like the most important players showed that they have what it takes, even the most dull season uh, of all of them, which was Ciders because it was spent in the trenches the other time. You walk away with saying, hey, he survived this season and ostensibly can be a lot better if you get him some help. The moments this season, Lucas Raymond's heroics, Patrick Kane's multiple heroic moments. We all remember, we'll remember forever, Ken and Mick's goal call on Patrick Kane's overtime winner at the United Center. Like the, You're right, Brad, the resilience down the stretch to even when they weren't playing their best hockey or getting the saves, they got the job done and did what they needed to do in those specific games. Like that, that to me is, it's great. For us to watch as Red Wings fans, it's something we haven't consumed and experienced in a long time. And it's great for the team. You would have loved for them to have gotten in and played four or five, maybe six playoff games and build some resolve and understand what that is for experience, but they still got a lot of really great experience. Dylan Larkin talks a lot about hating to lose. It's really great to hate to lose, but you have to learn how to not lose. And and I think, you know, getting this close, you can walk away with something there. Fully agree with you, Brad, as much as it pains me to say the down points are still the down points. I think I'm a little soft. Now that we're out of it, I, I've softened a lot on that slump in March. And so I think that's where we differ. So I, I understand that that was just a lot of crummy things stacking up. But all in all, it was a step forward this season. Job is not even close to being finished. A lot of big things need to happen. But for what the Red Wings managed to do as a Red Wings fan, I'm happy this season happened. I was the one who had the Red Wings finishing seventh in my preseason prediction. So. Yeah. I am definitely happy with how the season turned out. You know, I had them in the the 82 point range. I probably thought Ottawa and Buffalo would be far more competitive. So I think it's more of an indictment on their terrible seasons than how the Red Wings performed. You know, like you guys said, the, the best players on this team took the biggest leaps. And I think that's the key to take away from this. It's not about the, the March. The, the disappearances in March and December and all those sorts of, you know, doom and gloom moments of the season. I th- I think it's, you know, growing from the season and the best players are the ones who will be taking all of that away into next year. So I know we'll talk about it next, next episode, but next season could be really good for this team. And I, I think all the leaders on the Red Wings are uh, putting things in the right direction. Easiest question I'm going to ask MVP. Lucas Raymond. Lucas Raymond. Lucas Raymond. If if Dylan Larkin played 82 games, he might have been able to take that, but Lucas Raymond grabbed that down the stretch. Most improved? Lucas Raymond. James Reimer. No, <laughs> Lucas Raymond. <laughs> Lucas Raymond. Uh, I will say most surprising in both positive and negative directions for you. Most surprising. Patrick Kane being Damn a it. Detroit Red Wing. <laughs> yeah, Patrick Kane is... Not even just being a Detroit Red Wing, how he performed, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Who's the most disappointing? You said most disappointing, right? Yeah, most most surprising in a positive direction for me is Kane. Most disappointing, I got to say Cop. I I, I wanted him to do more this year. Feels like piling on the guy at this point, but yeah, yeah, it's Andrew Cop. You make that much money, I'm sorry, you have to deal with the expectation that comes with it. 
outside shot to Justin Hall too. If you if you're only playing 38 games, like he gets a DNF. Sorry, <laughs> too small of a sample size. Yeah, I think I'm with you guys on Andrew Cop as well. You know, maybe I'll throw in just to provide different discussion. I'll maybe add Joe Valeno. He was my guy. He was my ghost of the year. The it guy I for- spare? No, he's. The- this is the guy that I forgot was on the team the most. Yeah. Think of how many Red Wings games we went to this year. I can't name you one moment where I was like, wow, there's Joe Volano. Or, oh, yeah, there's Joe Volano doing something. I was always like, did he play? Where was this guy? So I'll add him in there uh, as my the tip of the cap as, uh, for someone else. All right. And your favorite moment of this season? Because there was uh, actually quite a few to choose from this year. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's definitely coming from one of the last two games. Oh, man, I'm tempted to pick either one of Lucas Raymond's two goals in that home game against Montreal, but David Perron saved the season with three seconds left in the season. Like, if Washington doesn't win that game, that's an all-time moment. Mm -hmm. Three seconds left in the season, and he rips one. How can you not pick that one? I get Patrick Kane, the romance, Chicago. Lucas Raymond had about a half a dozen moments you could pick, but that goal was nuts. The Jeff Petrie goal line <laughs> save to save the season. Hey, look, man, <laughs> people conveniently forget that one. There's so many, and you guys are right about all of them. For me, I'm going to go with the Patrick Kane overtime goal at the United Center, mainly because it spawned maybe the most ridiculous podcast episode i've ever i've ever seen <laughs> but you weren't it, there i i know and i'm glad i wasn't because then i can't get clipped but <laughs> you know it's it's a chris chelios jersey retirement night everybody knows what chris chelios meant to be a red wing and it's patrick kane coming back to chicago and the fact that it all played out the way it did and we get ken and mick to do the call how can you not be romantic about that moment I I have a hard time not picking the United Center, but I also think it's got to be that last, you know, 90 seconds of regulation and then into overtime where Goss's Bear climbed the ladder to do it. But then Lucas Raymond, it, it felt like even though we all knew it had happened by then, he really kind of came out and said, hey, I am, I'm him. Here's my goal to see the season. Here's my goal to to seal it in overtime. Like, I'm that guy. And you were wrong if you tried to write me off last season. Lucas Raymond is. Red Wings fans were electric in that moment. I, like the amount of people who have told me that is the loudest the LCA has been, period. And Lucas Raymond was the the main kind of facilitator of that with how he, he kind of lit Hockey Town alight. So no shortage this year for sure. Okay, long episode as the season reviews tend to be. So why don't we move on very quickly here? The exit interviews, we'll have more on this later, but a, a more conversation from Patrick Kane. And the consensus seems to be Patrick Kane wants term, and he doesn't exactly seem to think it's going to come from Detroit. It didn't seem promising the way he was talking. Steve Eisman did say there's mutual interest, but this kind of reads like a situation where Kane wants term, and I just don't know if the Red Wings are going to give it to him. Eisenman hates term, and he's 35 years old, so this was an issue everybody could have seen coming a mile away. I don't know what to read on this, because does Patrick Kane want the Malkin contract? That's five years going to take him into his 40s? Because, yeah, of course Detroit shouldn't do that. Are they talking their difference between two years, three years, three years, four years? I have a hard time getting a, a firm opinion on this, because we just don't know where that line sits right now. In any case, I think we're going to probably see him go all the way to free agency unless something changes. I'm not completely out on it yet, but if I was a betting man, I'd say Detroit has to try to find a solution without Kane next year based on how things are going. Elsewhere, the the typical things were said, you know, Sider and Raymond, you know, Sider revealed how sick he was and the injuries he played through, but him and Raymond said all the right things about wanting to be back on the team. They left playing there, et cetera. Larkin revealed how you know, much he went through this season personally and how supportive the team was. And he really kind of respected media for not drilling in and making a whole big deal out of uh, the personal situations that he and his his wife went through, which 
it was good to see that that you know the right for the most part people in hockey town respected that but also uh, you know he talked about how big of a season and, and how much he's not going to go he's not focused on vacation like dylan larkin's a dog like this guy wants to win and he hates losing he's going to go right into training and preparing for next year so if you want a leader that's going to bring the right lessons next season dylan larkin's on that path and then steve eisman said i think Something that was logical, but good to hear about Berggren and Johansson. Yeah, that he has to find spots for them next year. They are no longer eligible to go to Grand Rapids without waivers. So plan for them to be on the team. And we've been talking about that for a while. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't be traded. It's just there's got to be a plan in place because he's very aware he's not going to lose them for nothing. And I think Johansson especially with how the Red Wings blue line is and how good he is needs a spot on this team, like capital N needs to be on the team and not as the seventh defenseman bear Grin, Hey, he provides value to the team in a middle six role. I'm a little less concerned about him just because he feels more replaceable and there's less of an issue up front. But if Kane doesn't come back, you need a playmaker on a power play and bear Grin could at least fill that spot. So I, I am super, super curious to see how that actually plays out, but it, it's good that Eisenman realizes, like, just plan for it. Okay, that's our Red Wings season interview. It doesn't necessarily stop there. We are going to be talking a lot more about the season that was, but just in the interest of getting this episode done in any reasonable amount of time. Very quickly here, we'll we'll save the Utah stuff for next episode, but let's talk about the... NHL playoffs in our picks for the first round only. We'll only reveal first round picks for now for the, the sake of timing. Who, who do you have to win this this first round off across every series? I'll start with mine to give you guys some time here. I have Dallas in six over Vegas. I have Winnipeg in seven over Colorado. I have Nashville in seven over Vancouver. I have Edmonton in five over LA. And then in the East, I have Florida in seven against Tampa Bay. I have Boston in six against Toronto. A good tradition. I have the Rangers in five against the Capitals. And then I have Carolina and it's a sweep over the New York Islanders. We have the exact same picks. No. Yes, we do. Oh, <laughs> God. I hate when we do that. Uh, classic. We had different games. Okay. But we had the exact same picks. Well, then you might as well just go because. No, we know his now. All right. Fair enough. All right. I'll just say I had game sevens with Dallas Vegas, Winnipeg, Colorado. I had Nashville in four, uh, sorry, not in four. <laughs> Could you imagine? Nashville in six over Vancouver. I had uh, Oilers in five. And then on the other side, Carolina in six, Rangers in five, which should have been four. Boston in seven, which might be, should have been six. And Florida in six. All right. I'm going Dallas in seven. I'm going Colorado in six. I'm going Vancouver in six. And I'm going Edmonton in six. I'm going Carolina in five, New York in four. Told you it was five originally. I'm changing it four. I'm going Boston in seven, the true tradition. (laughs) And I'm going Florida in six. Okay. Let's jump into a very, very quick overtime here. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, the discord, the bonus episodes, the giveaways, all that and lots more. You allow us to produce this show, like mega episodes like this. You allow us to produce Expected by Whom, a show hosted by Sean Shapiro and Prashant Iyer. Give them a listen and subscribe. Also, you allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation and lots more. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Jogan Rafferty fan club says without knowing any of the upcoming moves Eisman will make this offseason, do you think they have enough talent currently in the system for the floor to be 91 points? It'd be nice for the wings to be pushing for a playoff spot again next year. But as we know, 91 points usually isn't what gets it done. No, they do not. They will need to have a good offseason to get back to 91 points. I think it's within range, but yes, the moves need to be made in the offseason. Yeah, if if Kane doesn't come back and Perron doesn't come back and Goss Despair doesn't come back especially, you can plug those holes with rookies, but you will need to find some points somewhere. Is the question, does the team as it sits right now have the ability to get back to 91 points? 
what they have in the organization. Because I'd say if you know we took this team right now and plopped them into next season, I would say for sure they could get 91 points again. If we're talking about erasing the UFAs and assuming they're not on the team, then I've got a lot of questions. Marty says, Friedman's comments on Kane's mood changing from positive in Toronto to guarded in Detroit seem to imply that term is the main holdup here. Eisman says there's still mutual interest, which appears genuine. How many years would you guys give Kane? I think I'd take three. Not sure if Steve will go there. Obviously dependent on what the dollar is, but three feels like my max. I would go as far as four just because of how special of a player he is. It is a 35 plus contract, so that makes it harder, but I, I would be happy to go further. That would have to be cheap though on the AAV. He can have term or dollars, but not both. I don't know. There's teams who might give it to him. And then depending on what that offer is, you might let them. Okay. Uh, we're going to cut overtime very, very short there. Apologies, but we'll answer the rest in the Patreon exclusive just for the sake of this being one of those unique episodes where we went way, way longer than we usually do because it's a pillar episode of the season. And we hope in future seasons that uh, we're having this this episode a few weeks later at the very least. We're going to thank all of you for tuning in. We thank Labatt Blue Light for supporting the Winged Wheel podcast and to all of our Patreon supporters. Thank you. If you are a listener who wants to support the show, but Patreon is not for you, give the show a rating, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, give the thumbs up. It, it makes a big difference and tell a friend. But thank you to all to all of our name level Patreon supporters. We can't do it without you. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Victor Zetterberg, new name level supporter, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham. Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. at the Cheesebag Navy, Avery's Sloppy Seconds, Brian Vasha, Carl Brutano Nanaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Instam, Cider, Comma Dickens, formerly Marlon Winchester, DJ Denton, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, Have You Ever Drank Baileys from a Shoe, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassan Al Kassem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, you Wanathan Tor- Tortirella Arjun, Kalen Wood, Marcus, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Ryan 50, Hannah Cap, Hannah, Scott Martin, Skeletor, Scree and Lube. That's what I appreciate about you. Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, A.B., Adam Rose, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Chuck Buff Chest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Layton and Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Darren. James, Eric Nance, Evans, fourth putt, brand new name level supporter, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, Joey, Joe, Josh Shabadoo, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Known Petrie Truther, The Mexinadian, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hall, Maximilian, Michigan Boy in Avs Country, Naruto's Punchable Face, Not Mad, Just Disappointed Wings Fan, Ophelia. Red Wing Tar Heel, Reed, Salt Lake Sugar Girly, Sean Mason, brand new name level supporter, Steven, the Hodag, the Hat123, Tom Iserplan, Respector, Wings Fan in St. Louis, Scott, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll be back with you next episode for our off season preview. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.